Um, I do want to express my, my great pleasure in being here. It's my first time. Um, and uh, as you know, it was a beautiful day, so it was quite a, quite a way to um, come to this town and to Trent. Um, I, I also want to thank Elaine and Dolly Day, um, the provost as well. Uh, it's a pleasure to be among some old friends, making new acquaintances. And I do just want to say a word before I begin about the importance, I think, uh, of lectures uh, endowed of this sort. Um, universities around the world are, are struggling uh, for a variety of reasons that is the, the subject of another lecture. But um, as, as in my own university, I watch the development office interesting neologism for <laughs> extracting funds from people um, and corporations. As I watched the development office try to raise almost 400 million to retrofit the football stadium that is used nine times a year, and watch the arts and humanities and social sciences in particular erode, as Elaine said, uh, it's quite something to be here uh, in this beautiful venue and uh, know that someone actually had the perspicaciousness and uh, critical wisdom to be able to offer support to sustaining critical work in the humanities and social sciences and let the football stadiums take care of themselves some of the way. Um, not against sport, one always has to say that. Uh, but, uh, it, it is really important uh, to, to figure out how to sustain critical inquiry uh, across the liberal arts, and that would include in that uh, basic science research at a time when funds for that and uh, popular support for that as well is going on. So I, I want to offer a special thanks and a special appreciation for um, the benefactor of this particular series. I hope it goes wonderfully, <laughs> apart from tonight. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, what I'm going to do tonight is uh, talk about a particular problem, as, as um, sorry, suggested. It's a problem that you know in Canada as well as elsewhere. Uh, and toward the very end, I will actually be showing some slides. Um, and we've worked out an arrangement so that the technician, who's been wonderful, can go home and get some sleep. That will involve me doing a little fussing here 10 minutes before the end of my lecture. So just bear with. I'll duck down, push some buttons, bring up the slides, and um, then um, people who need to can, <laughs> that's not you, that's him, can go home to uh, eat and sleep and recover for another day. All right. In recent years, France, Belgium, the Netherlands, Barcelona, and the Hesse state of Germany have banned select forms of Islamic modest dress on girls and women obtaining or delivering public services, including, of course, education. Quebec, Australia, and the rest of Spain and Germany have been debating such bans. Israel is also engaging the possibility, though for very peculiar reasons, namely the small but growing number of Orthodox Jewish women who have lately taken to wearing burqas and veils. The debates about Islamic women's modest dress in public space and public institutions have been framed by larger order concerns about multiculturalism, assimilation, accommodation, freedom, tolerance, and more in Western nations. But today I want to ask a slightly different question. I want to ask a different question about these proposed or enacted prohibitions on the headscarf, the niqab, or the burqa. And the question is this. What assumptions in and about Western secularism make possible this astonishing historical moment, one in which women's clothes, primarily, are the subject of legislation in 21st century Western liberal democracies? One in which, in the name of freedom, equality, security, or secularism, liberal democratic states have selectively chosen to mandate what women can and cannot wear, Indeed, one in which certain women have been legally required to take off their clothes in public or stay home, to strip or leave the public sphere. Now, in the course of pursuing these questions, 
I will not be discussing the obvious, that the West is in the midst of a giant fit about Islam, one that extends from the burqa bans to debates about whether a Muslim community center can be built on private property near the former World Trade Center, whether a public radio news analyst may freely remark on his fear of Muslims without jeopardizing his job, whether Muslims belong in the West at all, whether multicultural liberal societies can accommodate them, whether, as the German Chancellor Angela Merkel declared last year, and David Cameron and Nicolas Sarkozy echoed more recently, multiculturalism has failed. Nor will I be discussing the extent to which these bans convey an aggression toward Islam that exceeds any religious or racialized hostility legally consecrated by Western secular Western societies in decades, one whose fire is unimaginable for Orthodox Jews, Catholic laity, German Baptists, Hindus, or any other ethnic or racial group. I won't be discussing how banning Islamic modest female dress fuels Islamic anti-Westernism and violates the most basic precepts of individual and religious freedom in liberal democracies, or that the range of reasons given for burqa bans from the importance of immigrant assimilation, to national security, to gender equality, to preserving a religiously neutral public realm, to the need to see faces, cancels the credibility of each. I won't dwell on how the Burqa debates underscores the extent to which women are often made to bear the burden of culture, that in the name of protecting or emancipating women, living by religious codes or living by secular ones, securing majority or minority national values, the tiresome battleground of these conflicts remains masculine norms of feminine sexual comportment. Nor will I dwell upon how this preoccupation with ordinary women living ordinary lives often displaces Western attention from violence against women and women's persistent social and economic subordination in liberal democracies. I mention all of these issues to set them aside, as well as, of course, to open my hand. As should be clear, I don't believe the burqa bans can be defended in ways that meet minimum thresholds of liberal religious pluralism, individual freedom, or racial and gender non-discrimination. But what assumptions of and about secularism in the West make them conceivable and legitimate? That's the question I want to probe. To be clear, I'm not suggesting that it is Western secular assumptions that fuel the bans. The anxieties and aggressions I already mentioned certainly are responsible for that. Rather, my aim is to consider the conceits of Western secularism, including its historically French variant, laïcité, that make these bans plausibly legitimate in Western liberal democracies, or that make them appear to advance goals of individual liberty gender equality, and religious neutrality in public life. So I'm going to talk about five such assumptions, each of which has a scholarly as well as popular face in modern Western secularism. In other words, each is sounded in ordinary discourse, but also has an academic articulation. And I'm going to be moving rather loosely between these two orders of thought and speech. One other caveat before I move into the first assumption. I am not treating secularism as a unified concept or generic practice, nor am I trying to stipulate a particular definition of secularism as its truth. I join a number of other contemporary scholars in denying the viability of such moves, and I'm also not making claims about what secularism could or might be. Rather, my aim is simply to surface some key assumptions in contemporary iterations of specifically modern Western secularism, such that the questions, can liberal societies tolerate Islam, or should the burqa be banned, are questions that can be asked at all. All right, so the first assumption that I want to probe is the one I will also consider at greatest length. So don't panic if we're 15 minutes on and I'm still in the first assumption. It's the one that will take the longest to unveil, as it were, and will set up the, the, the premises for the others. It is that secularism generates a religiously neutral state, social, and public order. Or, put a little differently, 
that in drawing a firm line between church and state, religion and law, ecclesiastical and political authority, Western secularism secures a religiously neutral because religiously evacuated public sphere. So that's the assumption. Now, in many ways, this long-held assumption hardly requires analytic critique today, and not simply because it's been so powerfully challenged by contemporary scholars very widely in discipline and temperament, and they include Hans Blumenberg, Jeremy Waldron, William Connolly, Peter Danchin, Saba Mahmoud, Tomoko Mazazawa, Charles Taylor, Winifred Sullivan, Talal Asad, and others. But it's also the case that much antagonism toward Islam in the Euro-Atlantic world, including the Burqa bans, is overtly premised on defending Western values, and these values are often described as Christian, a defense that confesses non-religious neutrality on its face. Angela Merkel, elaborating on her claim that multiculturalism has failed in Germany, argued for the importance of recognizing that Germany is, quote, defined by a Christian view of mankind, end quote. In parallel fashion, Samuel Huntington, political scientist, insists that a multicultural West is incoherent insofar as, quote, Christianity is the central component of Western civilization. And yet, this sometimes avowed Christian, or oxymoronically Judeo-Christian, character of amorphous Western values nestles next to the assertion of the secular state as religiously neutral and bound to keeping all public life and institutions free of religion. Now what reconciles these two positions, of course, is a Protestant legacy and modality of secularism that formally banishes religion to private life even as it secures Christian hegemony in the West. And here it's important to remember that Western secularism, entailing far more than the separation of church and state, was and remains a distinctly Christian project in several senses. Shaped by the Reformation, it mobilized a Protestant theology of propositional belief, privatized worship, and individualized faith rooted in conscience along with a personal relationship with God. Now with this model of religion, propositional belief, privatized worship, individual faith rooted in conscience, this model of religion, with using it, secularism doesn't simply limit the reach of religious authority. It also gives religion itself a specific definition, shape, and meaning. Charles Taylor makes this point historically in his careful tracing of secularization's transformation of Christianity from a Weltanschauung, saturating the world and subject, into what he describes as an optional, privately clutched faith. Winifred Sullivan makes the point in the present through her remarkable study of US court cases concerned with religious freedom in which she finds that they do not merely adjudicate boundaries between church and state, but end up stipulating, defining, and even transforming religious content and practice. Saba Mahmoud makes the point comparatively as she analyzes how the infamous Danish cartoons, satirizing the prophet Muhammad, yielded injury that was incomprehensible to Western secularists, for whom the only and true locus of religion is always, as she puts it, the interiority of the individual believer, not the fickle world of material symbols and signs. These studies, with their widely disparate objects and aims, converge on one crucial point. Western secularism transforms not just the states, but the societies, subjects, religions, and beliefs it touches. And it paradoxically does so from a particular religious viewpoint. Put another way, whether animated by the concern to protect individuals from state imposition of religion, which of course is the story of French laicite in response to papal domination of French public and social life, or whether animated by the concern to protect religious belief from state interference, which is the story of US secularism in response to persecuted Protestant sects in early modern England, regardless of whether it's that one version or the other, Political secularism, shaped by, a refer by the Reformation, operationalizes these concerns via a specific model of religion, 
generically Christian, but more specifically Protestant, even in historically Catholic nations, this model is apparent even in the Declaration of, Universal, uh, Declaration of Universal Human Rights, where the right to religious freedom is stipulated as individual freedom of conscience, a distinctly Protestant and not only liberal formulation of such freedom. As secularism thus extends a particular model of religion to multi-religious societies, it essentially requires that other religions comport with this model to be legible and tolerable as religions. But proposition of belief, privatized worship, and individualized faith do not capture the theological form or content of many other religions, Islam, Judaism, even Catholicism. Additionally, insofar as the Western secular project Issues from a specific historical struggle between church, consolidating states, and minority religious sects. It marries the displacement of a centralized ecclesiastical authority by a centralized political authority and minority bids for existence. Now again, that history varies from how most religions and most parts of the world have or could undergo secular reform. The church is not the universal model for religious authority. The state is not the site through which secular reform is always and necessarily organized. And sectarian challenges are not necessarily the incitement for such reforms. Moreover, as Taylor, among others, has also made clear, this distinctly Western model of secularism universalized more than politically dethroning ecclesiastical authority inaugurates a very specific social imaginary, one that comprises a distinctive figuration and organization of the state, culture, religion, public, and private. In sum, far from a generic or neutral formula for separating the religious from the political, far from divesting the public sphere of religious values, Western secularism tacitly universalizes Christianity as the model for religion, and tacitly generalizes secular modernity's novel ordering of state, society, and individual, including the division of what is appropriately private and individualized on the one hand, public and shared on the other. Now, in the history of political thought, the universalization and generalization of Christianity in and by Western secularism is articulated, consciously or, or, or not, by a range of thinkers, among them Locke, Bale, Hegel, Feuerbach, and Marx. This universalization appears both in the specification of secularism's terms and in the dissemination of Christian theological elements across the very structure and relation of state, society, and the individual. You can see this in Locke's letter on toleration, where pulling apart church and state also generates a distinct identity, provenance, and purpose for each. More than simply promulgating a new public-private distinction, Locke's brief for the antipodal nature of religious and political society entails wholesale privatization and individualization of religious belief, dissociation of religion from power and force in favor of persuasion and faith, and the commissioning of religion exclusively for what Locke calls the salvation of souls. By implicit contrast for Locke, political society is built on individual interest rather than shared faith. It has the currency of force rather than persuasion, and it's concerned only with matters of this world. But even as he defines religion in Protestant terms, Locke's opposition turns out not really to sequester religion in the private sphere, Rather, the point is that it distributes its elements across the divide it expresses. Civil and political society are Protestantized even as religion is formally removed to the private sphere. As Jeremy Waldron reminds us, Locke's foundational equality in the political domain is itself profoundly Christian. And as Weber tells the story, the Protestantization of everyday life, which the Lockean social contract secures, is fundamental to capital accumulation, so it's foundational in organizing liberal democratic societies. The point, secularization on the model of Locke's letter 
does not so much banish religion to the private sphere as produce human subjects and practices and a political economic order replete with Christian elements disavowed, or better, normalized and generalized. Now, if Locke's formulation of religious tolerance offers one angle on the Protestantization of religion, the subject and political life comprising Western secularism, Karl Marx sheds a very different light on the Christian features of secular states and societies. His critique of Hegel's philosophy of writing and all the intros and prefaces that go with it touch frequently on the subject, but it's in the essay on the Jewish question that Marx really attempts to specify what he takes to be the Christian spirit and structure of secular bourgeois democracy. Exceeding mere historical content, according to Marx, this structure and spirit appears in the immateriality and otherworldliness of the state's proclamations of universality, liberty, and equality, in contradistinction to the concrete and lived unfreedoms, inequalities, and exclusions of civil society. So, Marx argues, the ideology of freedom and equality in the state is to the reality of actual life in civil society as heaven is to earth. In the celestial realm of the state, where citizens are abstract and unreal, we are all God's children. We're all free and equal brothers and sisters. But in the terrestrial realm of civil society, where we actually live and work, but which our political representation in the state includes, we're constrained and stratified by various powers and regard each other as tools or obstacles to our survival and ends. Now, Marx's argument, of course, is far more complex than can be adequately captured here. But key for our purposes is that the homology that he figures between constitutional democracy and Christian theology is for him an effect of the secular dissemination of religious consciousness that is often misrepresented as the mere containment of religion to the private sphere. So Marx understands secularism and the secular state not to eliminate the power of religion and political life, not to eliminate the Christian character of modern nation states or of Christian social imaginary, but rather to disseminate Christian social ontology, Christian hermeneutics, and Christian consciousness as, as political consciousness across civic and political life, even as secularism formally divests the state and public sphere of religion. There are lots of other ways of apprehending what I'm calling the Christian nature of Western constitutional orders that is unleashed by secularization. They're neutral personas with their Christian stu structure, spirit, and content. In addition to Marx and Locke, this insight has been formulated by Schmidt, by Blumenberg in the mid 20th century, and by, as I already suggested, a range of philosophers, political theorists, and scholars of religion today. But at this point, I hope we have enough to identify as well as disturb the first problematic assumption about secularism that I wanted on the table for us, namely the idea that secularism both stands for and generates a religiously neutral state and public sphere. Now we get to pick up the pace, and I also promise you that we're now going to leave the realm of heady political theory, canonical political theory, even though I was given permission to do it in the introduction, and um, move into a little bit more common discourse. So let's go to assumption number two. Western secularism is equally available to all religions. The second assumption in and about Western secularism relevant to the burqa bans is closely related to the first, and it requires substantially less development. And this is the assumption that regardless of its Christian origins, Christian mechanics and, and, and imaginary, Western secularization is equally available to all religions, including those practiced as minority religions within Western nations, and including those identified with theocratic or fundamentalist regimes in the non -West. This assumption is based on the notion, already considered, that Western secularism merely limits the provenance and reach of religion, but doesn't fundamentally define or transform it, and does not operate with a specific model of religion. That casts 
This assumption then casts those who resist secularization on Western terms as simply refusing modernity and its putative elements, religion relegated to the private sphere, and a public sphere wholly governed by reason, enlightenment, and the rule of law according to principles of freedom, equality, tolerance, and universal justice. Now, this assumption that Western secularism is equally available to all religions especially shapes the expectation that all religions align with a secular schema in which religion is reduced epistemologically to subjective faith, distilled spiritually to personal inspiration and or comfort, and confined spatially to home and church as the exclusive site of prayer, ritual, religious discourse, and other aspects of religious practice. Now, taking shape as a norm and regulatory ideal of secularism, religion subjectivized, personalized, and privatized means that public and collective expressions of piety, religious dress, fasting, praying in public, all of these expressions of piety then are not cast merely as violating secular tenets, but as signs of religious zealotry. In other words, the failure to privatize religion or religious expression in accord with these specific Western secular Protestant norms could, of course, be read as a sign of the partiality of those norms, their lack of general generality and universality, but instead, the tacit universalization and generalization of Christianity in this model of secularism has the tendency to cast religion insufficiently privatized as religion improperly or insufficiently tamed. Excessive, possibly dangerous, certainly pre-modern, insofar as secular containment <coughs> is taken to be a sign of the modern. As Salah Mahmoud has argued, US foreign policy projects concerned with secularizing Islam explicitly contrast the autonomous believer, the Western secularist, with the ritualist. The former is taken to be free and secular. She does all this by reading uh, US foreign policy documents on secularizing is in Islam. So the autonomous believer is free and secular. The ritualist is considered slavish to authority. But what if belief and ritual don't always divide so easily? What if it's only a Western secular hermeneutics that generates a subject for whom the material expression of religion, rituals, observances, laws, are linked contingently to religious truth? What if that doesn't work for all religions? In other words, the Protestant formula for secularization misaddresses and misrecognizes, for example, the Muslim who abides liberal legalism in all respects, yet may pray in public, wear religious dress, perhaps slaughter a sheep for a wedding. It also misaddresses and misrecognizes the Jew who observes religious holidays, fasts, or rituals that intrude on the work or school day. Such subjects do not register as sufficiently secular in the liberal imaginary, even though the degree or intensity of their piety may differ a little from that of a practicing Christian. What appears non-secular is simply the failure of these religious practices to remain within the bounds of home and church. If these practices were so contained, then the piety of the non-Christian religious subject might well be compromised. But the absence of containment within a discourse of secularism that demands it produces an interpolation of such subjects as insufficiently secularized at best and as religious zealots at worst. So, it surfaced and troubled assumption number two, namely that modern Western secularism is equally available to all religions. Assumption three. The third conceit of secularism that's relevant to our problem is that the widespread embrace of Western secularism, emerging from an early modern European history of bloody religious wars and vicious persecution, generates tolerance as a practice of mutual respect for all religions and cultures. Now this assumption includes the idea that tolerance itself is religiously and culturally neutral, that it's a simple power-free mechanism for accommodating different beliefs and practices within a single regime. As I 
argue at length in regulating aversion for all the virtues of tolerance over intolerance, and there are many, including the prevention of death and persecution. As a political practice, tolerance has from the beginning been an instrument of governmentality for large populations, striated not merely by difference, but by inequality and exclusions. Tolerance doesn't resolve, but manages these inequalities and exclusions, and at the same time depoliticizes them. It naturalizes these differences, and these inequalities and exclusions, as innately hostile differences, rather than featuring them as effects of history and power. So as tolerance ontologizes historically and politically produced inequalities and exclusions, it also reifies as natural the differential orders of power between the tolerating and the tolerated. In this way, it disavows and disappears the hegemonic norm that it is protecting, whether the whiteness or Christianity or heterosexuality that is tolerating its other. At the same time, tolerance discourse confers supremacy, beneficence, and normalcy upon the tolerant while consecrating the abject status of the tolerated. Only what is foreign, difficult, or unwanted is tolerated. Operating within an idiom of universal inclusion and justice, tolerance secures a hegemonic norm. It manages unwanted differences without granting them substantive or even formal equality. <coughs> tolerance, it's important to remember, is not a synonym for equality. It's a substitute for it. It's a supplement to it. Now, in addition to generating identities of tolerating and tolerated, discourses of tolerance always demarcate an intolerable. More than normatively deviant, the intolerable is the inassimilable danger, literally beyond the pain. It may merely mark untrustworthy members of a polity, as Locke thought atheists were because they couldn't be oath swearers, or it may mark a more egregious and aggressive enmity to civilization or to a particular civilization, as so-called radical Islamicism is often figured today. The point is that in no case are such identities there in advance. They're generated by specific regimes and norms of tolerance. And this is what makes tolerance more than a modus vivendi for heterogeneous beliefs and practices. This is what makes tolerance a mode of governmentality. An action that doesn't share power, extend equality, grant legitimacy, or actually enfranchise, but presents itself as an instrument of harmonious cohabitation, tolerance not only secures hegemony, but virtue for the regime hosting differences that it abjects, as it also protects them. Finally, tolerance can be severely regulative in setting limits and conditions on what it licenses. The move of a given identity or practice from the status of tolerable to intolerable is the price paid whenever these limits or conditions are violated. Now, this feature of the governmentality of tolerance is especially relevant to public expressions of piety that comport poorly with the Protestant model of secularism that I have been considering or when the subject and venues of modern Western secularism split along lines of public and private are simply unavailable or unattractive to those outside its ambit. Again, despite its role in identity production, regulation, and governance, tolerance always represents itself as a benign, power-free discourse. The only norm tolerance ever avows is tolerance itself. The only effects it avows are protections of minorities against majorities, or protections of the tolerant against the intolerant. Okay, so in a nutshell, problematic assumption number three is that tolerance, whether of a religion, a culture, an ethnicity, or a social identity, the assumption is that tolerance is non-normative, non-regulatory, mutual, power-free. And I've attempted in just very brief couple of minutes to, to suggest other ones. And the fourth conceit of secularism that bears on our problem is that secular regimes are not merely religiously but culturally neutral. In Western secular societies, culture, like religion, and I'm afraid too often in the case of new immigrants, often equated with religion, is formulated as a pro 
appropriately private, individually elective, and unpolitical. This dethroning of culture as a political and legal power is understood as part of what secularism achieves whenever it makes inroads outside the West. So in Western secular orders, Western individuals are understood to have a uniquely optional or free relationship with culture insofar as their individual moral agency is facilitated by culturally neutral liberal legalism. Conversely, rule by culture with a capital C, often associated with religious orthodoxy or pre-modernism, is what the unsecularized are presumed to suffer and what many new immigrants are presumed to bring with them to the Euro-Atlantic world. Secular liberalism then understands itself as having the task of getting such immigrants to conform with the cultural neutrality understood as culturelessness of the public sphere. That conformity requires containing culture along with religion to the private sphere, getting the power out of culture and getting culture out of power. In short, secular orders are understood to feature individuals with optional, privatized relations to culture and religion, while unsecular orders are popularly understood to feature subjects both saturated and governed by culture and religion. But culture individualized and privatized, what an odd rendering of culture. In fact, the non-neutrality of Western public space and institutions is manifest in the defenses of our cultural values through things like burqa bans, language laws, cultural tests for citizenship, and other stipulations for assimilation. All the German, Dutch, French, and Scandinavian mutterings over the last couple of years against multiculturalism tacitly identify a national or Western culture against which so-called minority cultural enclaves are judged and rejected. David Cameron's declaration last spring that multiculturalist policy has sacrificed promotion of a distinctly British idea of society makes the same move. Yet as with religious neutrality, Secular law's own circulation of cultural values is never allowed in these, these discourses. Cultural defenses are supposedly what minorities make against liberal legalism, not what liberal legalism itself circulates or provisions. So Western culture appears as that against which multiculturalism is judged, only to disappear again when secular law itself is at issue. This shell being with culture in secular Western discourse is richly illustrated by Samuel Huntington's discussion of the relation between culture, civilizations, and religion in his well-known work, The Clash of Civilizations. This is a work that, despite being now more than 15 years old, is still frequently reprised in opinion pieces on the post-9-11 world. Huntington writes, a civilization is a culture writ large. The values, norms, institutions, and modes of thinking to which successive generations in a given society attach primary importance. He adds, the great religions are the foundations on which the great civilizations rest, the fount of their culture. Okay, so for Huntington, schematically, religion is the origin, culture is the development, and civilization is the comprehensive expression of historically continuous values and ways of life. Now, bracketing the historical and anthropological dubiousness of this account, what's really striking is Huntington's list of the eight great living civilizations. And here it is. Sinic, Japanese, Hindu, Islamic, Orthodox, Western, Latin American, and, parentheses, possibly African. Now, this list is a fantastic confabulation of religion, culture, geography, nation, and continent. It features, on the one hand, the West, which contains in its appellation no religion, and actually can't, given its non-Christian origins in ancient Greece, nor does it have in its appellation any specificity of culture, nation, or location. And on the other hand, there's 
and all the other civilizations which are identified through and as religion, culture, and geopolitical space. So even Huntington's own insistence that civilizations are founded in religion and expressed as culture slips away in the West's singular transcendent identity within this typology, indeed zoology, of civilizations that it offers. But such classificatory practices, born from the same 19th century epistemic politics that brought us the order of world religions, brilliantly exposed as a colonial project by Tomoko Mazuzawa, this, these classificatory practices discursively associate the West with the secular overcoming of culture and religion by state, society, and individual. And this overcoming, I'm suggesting, is achieved in the naming practice itself. Other world civilizations are distanced from secularism as they are named through and with religion and culture. But legal neutrality, individuality, and universality define the West, while the rule of culture and religion define the rest. This, in turn, facilitates a presumption of reason and rational precedent as the basis of Western political and legal judgments, and of culture, religion, and tradition as being at the heart of those other civilizations. By turns again, this presumption legitimates defense of the advanced enlightened and enlightened against invasion or pollution by pre-modern roguish forces. Those who are presumed dominated by cultural and religious authority rather than organized by law, reason, and the moral autonomy of individuals. So non-Western cultural and religious groups discursively fused and frozen as the pre-modern and unsecular threaten or dilute the values of neutrality, rationality, individuality, and universality constituting the West. In a nutshell, the clash of civilizations. But returning to the question with which we begin, what makes women so often appear as the flashpoint of this clash? And it's not to say they always are, but they almost always are. This leads to the fifth and final assumption about Western secularism that I want to discuss namely its identification with gender freedom and gender equality. That secularism is equated with women's freedom and equality is evident enough in the fact that almost every defense of the burqa bans, whether in France or the Netherlands, Belgium or Quebec, identifies the twin purpose of these bans as, on the one hand, preserving religious neutrality in the public sphere, and on the other, commitment to gender equality. But this equation itself has a number of subparts. Secularism is presumed to generate women's freedom and equality, first, as part of its historical purpose and project, second, as a dimension of its universalization of justice, third, through subordinating religious and cultural inequality to legal equality, fourth, through freedom formulated as individual choice, fit through the elimination of sex segregation in economic and political life, and sixth, through replacements of modesty with transparency, cover with exposure, replacements themselves presumed to be indexical of women's sexual autonomy. I'm going to touch on each of these very briefly, none of them in detail. In a wonderful paper entitled Sexularism, um, it's really hard to say. Uh, historian Joan Scott, she named it this because every time she wrote secularism, when she was working on secularism, because she worked on sexuality for so long, her fingers did that thing that they do when you automatically type, and it kept coming out as sexularism. And then she eventually thought the unconscious is at work here, and um, she went ahead and wrote the paper on sexularism. So she notes in this paper, which is forthcoming in a book that I can't remember the title of, um, she writes, there's no necessary connection between secularism and gender equality. And the universality that secularism promises was always and remained troubled by sexual difference. With France as her focus, but thinking more broadly about the secular transformations of early modern and modern Europe, Scott reminds us that this era hardly ushered in women's equality and freedom in the public, let alone domestic realm. On the contrary, as separation of church and state was articulated in the French Revolution and elsewhere, women's domestic confinement 
was actually intensified by the new social arrangements brought by capital, and women were discursively identified with family, a sexualized body, and religious passion, together compromising the clear reason presumed necessary for public sphere existence. Now, secularism is neither a primal scene nor generic mechanism of women's emancipation. Why do we so commonly identify it with women's freedom and equality? Why do we identify its absence with women's oppression? What Scott calls emancipation by association draws on the historical affinity of secularism with a universal code of justice. Even though this universal code of justice, liberty, equality, fraternity, was sliced through with exclusions premised on sexual and racial difference. Apart from mythologized history, Western secularism is presumed to generate women's equality on the analytic ground already considered that it subordinates inherently patriarchal religions to gender-neutral liberal legalism. Susan Oken makes this argument explicitly, but it's tacitly shared by many liberal democratic theorists. And two further assumptions pertain here. First, secularism is always presumed to secure a rule of law free of religion and capable of subtending religious authority. And second, premised as it is on an abstract personhood, this rule of law is presumed gender neutral or easily capable of being made so. Together, these render secular liberal legalism as the imagined antidote to gender inequality that might be perpetrated by custom, tradition, and religion. But historically, as we've seen, this simply wasn't so. Now, though, I want to focus on a different dimension of what secularism and the rule of law fail to dislodge, namely the gendered and historically unprecedented division of labor between family and economy heralded by industrial capitalism and the naturalized, sacralized family that was its issue. As is well known, the European transition from agrarian to industrial economies brought a new order of separation between household and wage work and a new gender division of labor. Together, these had the effect of making women either radically dependent on male wage earners for survival, uniquely burdened in the work and public world, or both. Moreover, the nuclear family form, sacralized and naturalized, was both where gender norms are reproduced and is governed by a discourse of relation and need, as opposed to autonomy and rights, the only discourse within an emerging liberalism that legitimates inequalities, that is, relations and need, the discourse of the family, legitimates inequalities, as opposed to the discourse of the civic sphere. Now, importantly, glossing these divisions and separations and norms is the liberal democratic presumption of justice that equates formal rights and equality in, before the law with freedom. So once women have such rights and equality, they're understood to freely make their own lives. In other words, as with the status of religion and culture in Western public values, the gendered public-private distinction is foundational to Western social order, but vanishes in discussions of individual freedom and universality in popular secular discourse. Now, the sacral family, sacral insofar as it's both anointed by religion, but is also the literal depository of religion that's secured by Western secular arrangements, is thus crucial to reproducing gender inequality alongside formal legal equality. Consequently, even when feminist campaigns rectify women's exclusion from ostensibly universal rights, women don't secure substantive equality or freedom in secular liberal orders. Liberal democracies, privatization and depoliticization of the family, of reproductive labor, of constructions of sexual difference, and of religion, together secure women's continued subordination under the radar of equal rights discourses. Thank you. Yet another assumption of the Western of that Western secularism produces gender equality pertains to the idea that secularism features choice, while societies governed by religious orthodoxy do not. In fall 2010, 
Decades after Euro-Atlantic women defiantly rebelled against the sexual codes that bound them to roles of subservience, underpaid or unpaid or unrecognized labor, sexual availability, decorative objectification, the New York Times featured the photo montage that you see at the bottom in its on-the-street feature of the style page. And the on-the-street feature, as most of you probably know, is shot on the sidewalks of New York. It's not on fashion runways. It's meant to capture what real women on real streets are actually wearing. Now, I challenge anyone in this room to walk a mile in these shoes, let alone run for a bus, chase after children, walk in snow, stand all day at work, or even for just a couple of hours at a cocktail party. In Islamic female religious dress, you would be far more comfortable, far less likely to sprain an ankle, slip on ice, permanently damage your feet, produce chronic sciatica or other back injuries. You'd also probably have better concentration, as well as wider reach in your subjective imaginary. You'd be able to do more, move more, be less distracted by yourself as you engage the world. If these shoes are freely chosen, that doesn't make them shoes of freedom. Something, of course, that can be said of hijab or niqab as well. But to my knowledge, no one anywhere in the Western world has ever seriously considered passing legislation to outlaw the shoes. They're making, they're wearing, including in state offices. No one's ever suggested outlawing the million dollar plastic surgery industry largely devoted to aligning women's bodies and faces with preposterous forms of youth and beauty either. The woman on the left is recovering from plastic surgery. The woman on the right is a physician, pediatrician at work. So consider this 29-year-old white Western secular woman working for $14 an hour as an office receptionist, going deep into debt for a nose job and breast augmentation and regular access to these shoes, which is considered. And then consider a 29-year-old Muslim woman physician donning niqab each day before she goes to the clinic. The presumption, of course, is that the Western woman is choosing her shoes, her plastic surgery, her, West, her weekends shopping. But if not to deconstruct this notion of choice, for what have we been developing theories of social construction and discursive normalization and disciplinary power for the past four decades? To sustain the conviction that Western women choose their attire while Islamic women are coerced requires ignoring how conditions of choice are organized, how choice itself is normatively produced, it requires ignoring how we can be dominated as freely choosing beings, an idea that stretches from Plato to Mill, Marcuse to Foucault. It also requires ignoring how su subjects can choose against their freedom or equality, an argument for which we can draw from Hobbes as well as psychoanalysis. Above all, the conviction that Western women choose, while Islamic women are co coerced, requires ignoring the extent to which all choice is conditioned by power, by culture, and the extent to which choice itself is an impoverished notion of freedom, especially political freedom. Yet another subset of the assumption that secularism breeds gender equality pertains to the idea that gender equality and freedom are achieved through gender integration. Or put the other way around, the assumption that gender-segregated societies are inherently more inegalitarian and unfree than their opposite. <laughs> now, this too emerges from liberalism's formulation of liberty and equality at a formal legal level, an issue of the cultural, social, economic, and psychic powers that bear on the exercise of equal rights. In fact, feminists as far back as Mary Wollstonecraft and John Stuart Mill lamented women's isolation and the absence of solidaristic social organization as always impeding feminist consciousness and advancement. As Leila Ahmed notes, Western feminists have a tendency to believe that Islamic sex segregation is a sign of subordination and yet endorse women-only caucuses, support groups, and social venues to challenge the powerlessness of women in male-monopolized or male-dominated environments from families to boardrooms. 
We affirm the value of women's colleges, sports teams, women's centers, women's caucuses, but decry as a certain marker of subordination sex segregation in cultures that many Western women know next to nothing about. Finally, the equation of secularism with women's freedom and equality often traffics in the tacit assumption that bared skin and flaunted sexuality is a token, if not a measure, of women's freedom and equality. Sexual difference, of course, is already written into this assumption, since the equation of freedom with near nakedness in public is itself a gendered rather than generic sign of freedom. It's rarely suggested that men in loincloths are free, whereas those in three-piece suits lack autonomy and equality. So it's a reminder here that like the hijab, highly revealing Western female fashion is a negotiation, not a negation, of women's sexualized status and value in male-dominant orders. Slide um, dates me, but um, for those of you under 50, it's yeah. Hugh Hefner and his bunnies, um, the founder of Playboy's. In one case, if in one case, this sexualization of women's status and value in male dominant orders is robed or secreted in one way or another from public view, and in another is orchestrated through highly revealing fashion, expensive cosmetics, and surgeries. These are still but two iterations of this negotiation. Moreover, in both cases, women remain designated as bearers of culture in ways that men rarely are. And that is a bearing that itself indexes incomplete equality and autonomy. It's a sign that women remain something short of Kantian ends in themselves. In other words, in both cases, women are navigating heterosexual sexualization of female identity and they're navigating the tacit cultural assignment to secure religious, cultural, or civilizational identities. And these two problems interlock, although the how and why of that, I think, remains to be theorized well. That said, certainly the association of freedom with sex integration and bare female skin is challenged, if not rebutted, by the hijab-wearing professional woman one who may also be quite fashion conscious, but above all, retains some of the advantages of sex segregation in male-dominated spaces, one who may place women's agency and perhaps even women's freedom on what Salva Mahmoud has identified as a non-liberal secular trajectory, and one who makes no pretense that women own their sexuality or that mingling with men in skimpy clothing is itself a sign of freedom and equality. Hmm? That was a little early, but we'll get to it now. If interculturally, this bit of clothing does not protect its wearers from men for whom privilege and entitlement knows no bounds, it may remain an intracultural sign of honor and modesty, a marker of civilization that only those convinced of civilization's exclusive ownership by the West would mistake for its opposite. Indeed, in the Dominique Strauss-Kahn debacle, there is perhaps no single recent episode more revealing of the extraordinary reversals and displacements entailed in contemporary Western civilizational discourse that identifies the West with enlightenment, rationality, the rule of law, truth, and gender equality and identifies the non-West with theocracy, arbitrary violence, and relentless male dominance when the powerful Frenchman satisfied his own desire by assaulting, putatively, an African Muslim maid in his expensive hotel suite. Was she, in his mind, already so non-human as a maid, as an African, as a Muslim, that her consent, which he said he believed he obtained, was no more relevant than that of a creature destined for his dinner plate? To be clear, I am not defending the burqa, condemning the bikini, equating them, or defining them as sheer opposites. I'm actually not that interested in these pieces of cloth. As Foucault once said of sexuality, the ostensible topic of his three-volume study in 10 years of life, I'm not really that interested in it. Sex is boring. I'm simply, similarly uninterested in these pieces of cloth 
above and consider it a mistake to compare degrees of women's freedom and equality east and west. My aim tonight has simply been this. By reflecting on the false robes of religious and cultural neutrality, tolerance, gender equality, and freedom, the false robes of these things in which Western secularism drapes itself and through which it casts Islam as its opposite, I have simply sought to unveil some of the Western civilizational delusions entailed in the justifications and the legitimations of bans on Islamic female religious dress in Western democracies. It seems to me that these delusions suggest that Western self-scrutiny, rather than concern with what Muslim women wear, might better advance women's equality and freedom, not to mention civil peace and cohabitation in what is an irreversibly heterogeneous cultural era of Western liberal democracy. Thank you.
might need the mic in your case. And this is more of a clarifying question. Yeah. Um, so is the Western body as the neutral body? And it's under subsume the particularity of the body under like, the generalities of equality and tolerance in that big field in order to make the body, the physical body, anti political? Or what's that explicit relation between the body and these universal rights or the universal rights that are dictated by liberal democracy? I think that's a great question, and I just want you to ask it one more time because it's complex and I just need to hear it again. And it's not it's, it's not your fault. I just need to hear it one more time. It gives me a chance to think too. All right. Um, so the Western body, right? Western uh, sex body or just body? Generic? Yeah, the physical body. But female and male or not? I don't care. Oh, you don't know or you don't care? Okay, fine. Just the, or we've talked about the female body. Okay, Western body. I'm, I'm taking the point. Western okay. body. Body, right? The Western can be characterized as a neutral body. Um, and then is that an attempt to subsume its particularity, the particularity of its interactions, the forces between bodies, and that would go into the dress and, you know, the shoes and all that, um, to subsume it under the generalities like liberal, liberal democratic equality, peace and liberation and freedom and all those great ideals um, to make the body anti-political, to make it not as a site for politics, but to make it under the generalities I that see. doesn't really affect the body, or it affects the body, but doesn't make the body an empowered agent. Okay, so let me say it back to you and see if I've got it. Um, it'll go like this. Is in, in, in what I'm describing as a kind of civilizational discourse about the non-West, and in particular about Islam today, um, where Islam is figured as non-Western even when it's inside the West, is, is that discourse also stipulating the Western body as a body that is uh, unpolitical, neutral, as it were, and um, in no way uh, in, in mesh or engaged in power relations, in how it signifies, what it wears, how it deploys itself, how it moves through public, and so forth. Is that more or less the question? Yes, it's more yeah. the um, I, I think on one level the answer would be yes, that is, Partly what goes on in this kind of a discourse of othering is the displacement of the politics of freedom and equality and the politics of emancipation always to an elsewhere. And in that displacement is an evacuation of the politics of the making of this subject, this body, this comportment, including this gendering. And I think that's absolutely right. So another way that I would spin your question, and I don't know if this takes it too far afield from what you were trying to say, is that part of what I think some critical feminists have been trying to reveal for a while is that preoccupation with the imagined oppression and unfreedom and inequality of women outside the West or women from outside the West in the West, preoccupation with that has the effect of displacing or washing clean all the continued ways in which subordination and inequality operate in everyday liberal democracy. It's one of the things that I was trying to suggest. But you brought it to the to the level of bodies in particular, and I think that's exactly right. And I think you know that's why um, you can have these arguments, and I've had them in rooms like this about, well, these women are choosing these shoes, and they can take them off at night, and nobody told them to put them on, and um, they're fun or they're not fun, and if you don't want to wear them, fine, but it doesn't matter because it's not being required by anyone or anything anywhere. And of course, what that does is make recourse to an understanding of power that Foucault taught us to be suspicious of. It makes recourse to an idea that power is always saying no, and that's the extent of power. It's, it's, or it's always declaring a law, or it's always declaring an injunction. And it, and it elides the extent to which power produces desires, choices, 
uh, norms, deviations, and what happens if you, um, as a friend of mine put it, show up at a wasp wedding in the flats. <laughs> or, um, but also show up you know, at, the, at the opera in shorts. And those are benign examples. Those are very benign examples. But it, it doesn't get at the extent to which bodies and um, choices and adornment and comportment are important sites of social, gendered, sexual construction and are going on everywhere in all cultures, and we will never be rid of them. The point isn't to be rid of them. The point is to ask ourselves what our investment is in saying, as you put it, um, it's not happening here, it's only happening over there. Uh, a question for embedded in comment on what you will. Um, it seems to me that one of the, uh, the West concern uh, with Islam particularly is that he would find uh, Islamic cultures intolerable to live in. Uh, and then the reaction of um, if population is get too big in the West and we get a voting lobby and they can change up the policy, i.e. public schools in trial area, where a lot of groups in Tokyo, for example, are lobbying to have their kids excised from health classrooms, worrying about same-sex marriages as the normalized. And the, the view of, of many Islamic groups to, to uh, create to re the Ummah uh, within communities in Frederick and Charles Eastern, for example, where it becomes normative then to shut down schools for Friday prayers, schools that are mixed, secularized, irrigated, and so forth and so on. And people um, in the West uh, see with integration and shifts of ethnic demographics uh, regionally uh, potentials for, um, if you will, using your uh, analysis here, turning back clocks to pre modern times and don't want that in your backyard. So, um, it's a useful question. I think what's important for us to remember is the extent to which these negotiations have been going on and will go on forever. Um, and again, I think that the idea that there is some um, standard for, uh, what, say, health or sex ed classes are, um, certainly where I live is still a huge struggle. And it's not a struggle between uh, Islam and Christianity. It's a struggle about you know, what it's legitimate for students to learn and what they should be learning. And um, even where I live in California, there are still parents who keep their kids home when um, they're, they're, when, when homosexuality is discussed in the classroom um, and they're keeping them home on the ostensible basis that the children are too young to be learning about it or that they'll find out on their own that this is not something, this introduces them to the idea of sexuality too early or something like that. But my, more, my larger point is I certainly understand anxiety about about challenging cultural norms of education, of um, conduct, of organized activities, and neighborhoods. I, 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 you know, we all have that anxiety about whether the way we do it and what we believe will continue to be able to persist when we notice that we, we are not the we that we were this year, last year, 10 years ago, um, and that that we is shifting. And I, 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 I'm, not, I'm not minimizing that anxiety, but I do think that bringing it to the surface and figuring out how to navigate it is going to be fundamental to surviving this century. Just fundamental. Because we, uh, that's why I ended where, we, where I did. We are an irreversibly heterogeneous global world now. There is no purity left. And that means we have to figure out how to live cheek by jowl with people we didn't necessarily choose to live with and whom we may not agree with about certain things. And we have to figure out how to have conversations and deliberations and legal and political negotiations that work these things through. And I'm saying that not just to those who understand themselves to be secular, liberal, Democrats, 
But to all of us, that is the one thing I would say to all of us, that we have to figure that out. And it's not always going to be easy. I mean, there are plenty of episodes in Canada ranging from, you know, I remember a couple of years ago when I was here, I think it was two years ago, there was a big issue about whether this um, Orthodox Jewish show um, that was facing a gym in Montreal, I don't know if you remember this episode, um, could ask for that gym where young girls were working out to have um, curtains placed or shades placed over it, um, or whether it could do the placing of the shades or whether the gym would do it. And for a while the shades were placed and then the girls said they had the, or no, it was just girls, the, 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 the workout people said that they had the right to have fresh air and sunshine and to hell with the Orthodox Jews. And you know, that's just a, that's a very simple, um, conflict on some level, you would think you could work out a way for uh, the shul to um, figure out if it really felt determined that these boys should not be exposed to such things in their young teenage years or they wouldn't be paying attention to the Torah. And they're probably right. Um, <laughs> anybody who's ever taken a kid through a bar about my there are plenty of things that you want to do besides that. <laughs> And girls exercising are probably one thing you want to look at. So that 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 concern over there seems like you know one that has its legitimacy, and then the desire for being able to exercise and fresh air and sunshine seems like it has its legitimacy. And I'm not trivializing the larger anxiety you're raising, which is look, we have some standards that we consider modern Western decree. And, and gender equal, and if those are if those are going to be compromised, that's that's the limit. That's where we're that's where we're not going to go. Well, I think what we have to do is not start there, but start with the question. I think it's a question Canadians ask a lot about accommodation, but also ask a bigger question, which is not just how we accommodate, but how we converse, how we negotiate, how we navigate living together, and um, you know, our history as humanity. Uh, tends to go to war over these things more often than it tends to uh, figure out democratic ways of settling them. And I, I do think if we're going to survive this century, we're going to have to figure out the latter. I know that's not a satisfying answer. risk 
of becoming reactionary, which is to say becoming authoritarian, becoming absolutely demanding conformity, absolutely demanding comportment with its norms because otherwise it will be destroyed. But what was so wonderful about your question following on the previous one is that the previous question, sorry, I don't know your name, <laughs> represented this problem from the position of dominant culture that it fears being destroyed. So I do think the danger is always that reactionary hardening. We're in trouble. We'll lose everything if we give way on this stuff. Well, if we say, okay, where there's really a minoritarian condition, where there's real fragility or endangerment, that's where we give extra breaks to being able to be culturally pure. I just think that road, that down that road lies nothing but trouble. First of all, everybody can identify with it eventually, because anyone who feels that impurity or having to adjust to different perspectives or realize that we don't have the truth or realize that what we thought was our cultural neutrality, our absolute tolerance, our absolute freedom, equality, and universality is not so. It's rather dominance that is expressed as those things. It means that anyone can go down that road. But the other problem is this. I do think that, I don't know anything about Quebec either. So let's say we're on the same page, but now let me say something I think I know that may be a big risk. It seems to me that the other particular problem that French Quebec has, that France as such doesn't have, is that it was even more heavily dominated by the papacy than France was over the last 150 years. Somehow France got the thing thrown off, you know, more, more or less. Um, well, not somehow, I mean, it was a French Revolutionary Act, but um, it, it was, it, and that doesn't mean it was thrown off in any, you know, and it's certainly, you know, it's a different story in Paris than it is, you know, 50 miles, 50 kilometers outside of Paris, but that has obviously not been the story or the experience for many in Quebec, so at least by my reading, what you get are people saying, look, you know, my, my mother was kept barefoot and pregnant and uneducated by the church, we are not going back to that. And, and, and that does add a, a layer of complexity. That means that story has to be part of the negotiation that's happening over, over the question of comportment, um, uh, the question of what people are doing or saying or believing or wearing. But here's the, here's the question I want to throw out to the middle of this. What I've never found anyone able to explain is why 12 women wearing the burqa in Quebec really does threaten the advance that many Quebec, that, that, that many Quebecois feel they made when they got out from under the papacy. And um, you know, it's the same question we have to ask in the U.S. all the time about gay marriage. You know, why, why does it threaten heterosexual marriage? What is endangered exactly? And I do think that there are places and issues in, in different uh, regimes of law where we will see literal conflicts about what we consider acceptable and unacceptable. I'm not sure a tire is ever one. I'm just not convinced of it. I've yet to see why the um, women wearing headscarves in my modern political theory class are more of a problem than the water polo players who seem to miss every two classes because they're always off at tournaments. And that, that to me is like a way more serious problem. <laughs> I like water polo and I like these particular women, but I want them in my class, and that, that, that and anyway, so I, I'm just not convinced that attire ever is going to really hurt anybody else. I do think there are other issues that probably will be in negotiation about as we live in, in, in heterogeneous orders. I'll be sure. Um, one thing I'd like to ask is, in your discussion of tolerance, 
you never talked about um, watering things down. It seems to me that secularism, to some degree in the Western world, is about watering things down. People are so concerned about uh, not hurting anybody's feelings that they massage things. And they seem to be quite concerned about the fact that, uh, for example, Muslims in this case, or Orthodox Jews, are not prepared to do that. That makes people uncomfortable. And I think that that is one of the things that our Western vision, version of secularism is about watering things down. And, uh, and maybe not having any real convictions. And I think sometimes meeting with people who have real convictions makes us uncomfortable. I, I completely agree with you. And, and the only quibble I would have with, with your formulation is that, so, you know, the question is whether secularism requires privatizing your passions and your belief and your conviction and your faith, or whether it necessarily requires attenuating, or whether the one is the other. And, and I think for some people, the one is the other. But what I was trying to do tonight was also suggest something that I think it's odd, but it's so incredible to a lot of people, that, that, you know, simply the fact that something's not privately contained doesn't actually necessarily make it like radically more passionate. And it's just a different organization of things. You know, I mean, praying in public doesn't mean that you're more related, more, more, more deeply religious than praying in private. It's a different ritual. And so I agree with you that there's anxiety about, um, you know, Jews who actually honor the Sabbath, Muslims who actually pray many times a day, people who wear religious garb. There is anxiety in some circles about that, especially left secular circles. But I also think there's something else, which is just, just ignorance about what we assume to be the sign of secularism, that you, made it, that, you, that you made whatever crazy beliefs you have really private, and that in public you carry on in some other way. So that's the only quarrel I would have with that. But I, I do agree with you that, that um, zealotry is imagined to be a terrible thing. Which is also really sad these days because probably we need nothing more than some political zealotry informed by some kind of deep belief or hope in the future of human beings to, to rescue themselves from the various precipices that we've taken ourselves and our planet to. And I'm not saying zealotry in the sense of, you know, stupid and 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 uh, what I want to say, impatient or unthought through political passions. But, but passion, you're absolutely right, it's not inherently a terrible thing in the public sphere. And we do have an idea of some sort of civil comportment that requires it. Thank you very much. Uh, Wendy, I, I don't want to put that conversation off. I'm going to take about two or three more questions. And uh, then we're going to... That's okay with you. Thank you for being here tonight. I'm a science major, so one thing that really resonated with me about your talk was um, your mention that women are bearers of culture. I wonder if you can give a few more examples of how that's manifested, and maybe talk a little bit about what that is. Please. Tell did you mean we take two or three in a row? Was that your idea? Yeah, why don't we do that? Okay. Uh,
were public and also involved perhaps a specifically Muslim democratic kind of flavor, for lack of a better word. I think that caused Do you mean the Arab Spring? What we come to call the Arab Spring? Or do you have something else in mind? Um, I mean, do you mean like the uprisings in the Middle East? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. I, I just needed to know where we were in London. Really. You know, we had lots. Yeah. Chile. <laughs> That's okay. I think what's particularly interesting about those uprisings is the anxiety, the anxiety of kind of these public expressions mixed with what's seen as a religious aspect. I don't know, it seems to me very interesting. And I'm wondering if you would at all comment on those, because I think you're interesting. Okay. So, can I just do this briefly? Yeah, two more. And then yeah, then. that's fine. So, um, you know, it's not my point. It's actually one that, that um, feminists have, have been making now for a few decades. Um, that, that women get assigned this task of being bearers of culture so often, not exclusively. We have the Kirpan debate now um, in Canada, and we have it a bit in the US as well. So there are, you know, sometimes men carry insignias or signs of culture, but more often what do we see? We see women assigned the task of representing the culture or designating us as um, the, the insignia of culture and to take off those signs is somehow often, especially in threatened cultures, considered to be a, 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 a real danger to the culture, that if women step aside from that position, and that often happens, for example, in the US, in Native American legal cases where women may challenge Native law, um, and to do so, say, about intertribal relations or about property or something like that, and to do so is often seen as betraying their culture. Um, certainly it was a very common invocation during um, the Black Power Days in the US um, that it was important for women to be subordinate to men because it was part of what was holding the culture together and that today's endangerment of uh, black masculinity um, is in part the result of women refusing to stay in that place. So what do we see? The quick logic of it, obviously, is that through a certain uh, sexual division of labor in which women are not only uh, made responsible for production and reproduction of domestic life, they're also made responsible for production and reproduction of culture and to depart that is to literally understand them as, as ceasing to transmit some aspect of culture, usually quote unquote designated as traditional. Um, but not always, because what I was trying to suggest is that there's some way in which women's bared skin in the secular liberal democratic West is also taken as a sign of culture, cultural emancipation, sexual equality, um, it's also, so it's, it's, it's not, a, it, it's a complicated zone. And, um, and anthropologists have been working on this for a really long time. Um, feminist theorists used to pay more attention to it than they do now. Unfortunately, I feel like the multiculturalism debates have pushed it aside, and I think we need to bring it back as a, as a, as a, as a central domain of inquiry. What does it mean? to make um, women responsible for transmitting culture? What, what conservative de definition of culture does that inscribe? What um, sexual subordination of women does that entail in the idea of preserving culture? So all I've done is elaborate a bit, but I haven't answered the question. I just think it's an important zone of, of inquiry. Um, the anxiety about whether we're seeing liberal democratic or theocratic uprisings in the Middle East is a huge issue. Um, yes, I do follow it really closely. Um, I don't have a lot to say about it tonight because I think uh, it is the topic of a whole other, not just lecture, but year-long study that we all have engaged in. Um, but I think you were asking not just about what's actually happening in the Middle East, but what, what's going on in our readings of um, 
you know, is this is this a democratic uprising or is this a theocratic uprising or is it democratic that then gets co-opted by um, the Muslim Brotherhood or something like that? And I think um, yes, there's some relationship to what I'm talking about tonight in the sense that the, it represents an ongoing Western anxiety about whether there can be forms of democracy, freedom, and agency, collective and individual, that don't look like those in the Euro-Atlantic world. And I think that is a question we must be asking all the time. Can there be forms of democracy, collective, individual, agency, formulations of justice that don't look like ours? It's a hard question, and, and there are lots of people working on it, um, but it's the question we don't see often enough in the opinion pieces and, and punditry on the question of whether these are democratic or theocratic revolutions. What if that distinction, what if that opposition wasn't the right one? Of course you can be questioning. 
And um, you know, I'm hoping some of these near naked girls that my son's running out into the street with at midnight are also questioning. But who knows? <laughs> anyway, I'm just saying that. In fact, um, it's not. It's it's it's. You're absolutely right that that's the that's the Western divide that we paint. And I think you're also saying, you know, we need to see these are two different ways of negotiating the sexualization of women's bodies. And I want to suggest neither one signifies oppression or emancipation. They do signify different things, both to those inhabiting it and to those viewing it from the outside. But I want to suggest neither one simply signifies oppression or emancipation. I know that's a hard thought to hold, especially since you know people often say to me, "Oh, but do you want to wear that?" I don't know. I mean, anyway, it's a, <laughs> another 